Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Just a heads up, I do have my parents' two dogs here with me. So beyond my own dogs, I have both Cutie and Quinby, and they can be very talkative and also reactive. And so just so you know, uh, they are here, but they are very good. They know, uh, they kind of have gotten the gist of whenever they come to Auntie Kel's house, they get treated for being quiet and we have a little bit of structure. Whereas my dad, Dr. Marty Becker, he always jokes like he's a veterinarian, not a trainer. So they, they always go back really quiet. And they're like, my, my dad's like, Oh my God, it's a miracle. They're so quiet. And I'm like, Hey, keep it up, dad. And I feel like it's so much harder to train people, especially your family than it is to train dogs. So just, just be forewarned, but hopefully, hopefully we'll be all good. And so with that said, if we can, I'd love to jump into the presentation because I have a lot of different videos to share with you. And I personally love videos for the reason that I feel like it illustrates so much of what we're trying to talk about. And for me, it's really helpful to see it in action. So we're going to be very video heavy. And just so you know, as well, I do have some follow-up resources and Leilani is going to drop in a resource in the chat as well which has a full outline of today's talk and then some, because there's so much more that we could talk about in terms of body language that there's just not enough time. So I wanna just get into the really good stuff and, and into the meat of it. So the dog right here is Otis and you will see him a lot in this webinar. He is our rescue dog. We were his fifth home by the time he was seven months of age, lots of different issues. And one of them absolutely is reactivity. So you'll see him quite a bit. And then, so when we look at some of the root causes of reactivity, and when we're talking about reactivity in this webinar, it's not only things like that reactivity on leash, so the lunging and barking, but I'm also gonna include also some of those, those generalized anxiety or the sound anxiety or the noise phobia that you may have the dog that starts to, that's very talkative, that likes to give a lot of feedback that does more of that watchdog type of barking. Because a lot of times I found that those kind of can go hand in hand. And so a lot of times when we see anxiety on and walks, we may see that in the home as well. So it's really important from my perspective to be able to tackle both. So some of the ways that this a dog may be influenced on this is genetic. So their parents having the, the tendency towards having higher fear and anxiety, you're going to have a higher likelihood that their puppies will as well. And then also that early environment and learning. So with Otis, our, our dog here, that's him again, by the time we got him, he really had missed out on a lot of his learning. And I, I really do think he had a very limited sheltered existence. So everything was really, really new to him. So that's where that early socialization is very important. And also we can even look at things at, at the age of adoption. So dogs that are adopted too early, for instance, can have a higher likelihood of displaying reactive behavior. So that's where it's really important to be adopting at least at, at eight weeks or later, rather than trying to adopt too soon. And that's in the case of, of, of course, it being from a, a, a good place that they're coming from rather than a place that's really impoverished. So, and other things too. So when we think about emotional components, so underlying fear, anxiety, and stress absolutely plays a huge, huge role in this as well as over excitement and frustration. There are those dogs that are perfectly fine with dogs off leash. And in fact, they love to play, but they're highly reactive on leash. And a lot of times it's just that building frustration, that escalation, that over excitement, they don't even know what to do with themselves and that impulse control really suffers. And then we can have that, that rehearsed reaction on leash, especially if there's any punishment involved. And so the methods that we go through today to address that, we are looking at different solutions that are really rooted in rewards that help the pet to feel better at an emotional level, which is really important. And also looking at underlying medical causes. So pain, for instance, can be really highly attached to the issue of reactivity, also noise phobias and so a lot of times when there is that underlying medical component, such as back pain, that can actually increase the dog's reactivity on leash. So that's where it's really important for all of these dogs to be very well evaluated by a veterinarian and to stay in close contact with that vet throughout. And also illness. So my, my our late pug, Bruce, for instance, all of a sudden he started to show this reactive behavior. He had never shown it before ever in his life. And that for me was a, a clue that, hey, something's going on because he was about seven or eight years old when this all of a sudden escalated. And sure enough, he unfortunately did have cancer. And sometimes you can't see that. So if you see a sudden behavior change or worsening, always really important to talk to the vet and, and to always 
go back. So if you just have a feeling something's a little different, definitely go back in and, and really be closely connected with them. It's also important to remember that, that animals learn their whole life long. So it's not only during puppyhood that animals are learning how to react. A lot of times it's that cause and effect. So it's, it's like that they learn that, Hey, whenever this, in this situation, if I do this, this works to give me that relief that I need. So for instance, that little dog, and a lot of times people see those little dogs that are really yappy and they'll say, Oh, he thinks he's a big dog. He thinks he's tough. Well, really a lot of times those dogs have just learned that a good offense is their best defense. So when that little dog, for instance, starts barking, a lot of times that person and that dog may move away. A lot of times they'll be picked up and they may be pulled away themselves. So they get that distance and that space they need and that feeling of security. So they learn, it's almost like those dogs, as our friend Debbie Martin <laughs> likes to say, that they, it's almost like they've taken a good self-defense class. So a lot of times there's still that underlying root cause of fear, anxiety, and stress, but they just are more confident and comfortable in being able to use their self-defense skills to ask others to back off and to get that space that they need. And so that's also where it's really important for us to come in and to give them different ways of reacting and feeling in those situations. And also remember that there's also a social component. So for dogs that are really reactive, it's super important to address this. And, and when we're addressing this, also be thinking about ways that maybe in that situation, like with, with Otis here, you'll see a video of me walking both him and Indiana Bones, our other dog, when we first got Otis. And after I realized he had some pretty high reactivity, I started to actually walk them separately until I could get his reactions a lot better on leash before introducing the two back together again. And that's really important because there's that social contagion. So a lot of times with like those emotions, the emotions of fear, anxiety, and stress. A lot of times pets pick that up from other pets. So they can pick up those, those scents, those pheromones, the behavior of the other dog, and also that social facilitation. So I don't know if you've ever seen this with your own dogs, but when one dog starts to bark, a lot of times other dogs are going to join right in. And in fact, that's one way that you can teach a bark on cue is to even start barking yourself or to even start playing the sounds of other dogs barking. A lot of times that can get the dog barking. So a lot of times, and I've worked with so many clients who their dog wasn't reactive, and then they went to stay with a, a friend with family member or they were walked with another dog that was reactive and their dog picked up on that behavior. So a really important thing to be aware of. So when we look at this, it's also really important to always remember the root cause because sometimes that dog can seem really forward. They can seem really confident, but a lot of times there really is that underlying fear, anxiety, and stress. So I'm going to go ahead and show you this video with Eli and you'll see him quite a bit throughout this webinar as well. Get a reaction. I'm just going to do a same okay. a job, just like you did earlier, where you just mm -hmm. are redirecting that focus. Yeah, and you can tell he definitely feels unsafe mm -hmm. because he always, yeah, he wants to go back there whenever he's feeling uh, uncomfortable. He wants to go either under my yep. legs, they're back in the house. Yep. Look. But I can see that this would be something that we can Yeah, and you can even deal with. So I don't know if you noticed that there, but notice how he was really forward and out in front and really lunging on the leash and barking. And yet once that thread had passed, he's like, okay, now I can turn around. I feel safe to turn around and, and to get space. And like, oh, I want to go hide behind mom. I want to run in the door. So a lot of times, even though those dogs may seem really forward, there really is that underlying fear, anxiety, and stress. And here's a, a an example of Otis. And Otis, when we first got him, and for a while there was highly reactive. And this is not even the the full extent of how reactive he was. So this is him seeing a person way at a distance. But uh, just look at his body language, and this is pretty common for what, what you'll see with reactive dogs. <laughs> So notice his posture is really stiff, his tail is really up and forward. And even though his tail is curled, you can see it's curled really, really tight. So paying attention to where the dog's normal tail carriage is, is one really good indicator of their tension. And so a lot of times when you start to see those initial signs of the, of the dog getting tense, 
or just starting to show even those slight signs of stress, that's a good time to intervene and to gently redirect them to another behavior that we can reinforce them for. And we'll go into that a little bit more. So a few things on ways that we can help our dogs. So first of all, it's managing exposure and pairing positives with those situations as much as possible. So pairing those positives with those stressors that, that our dog does react to. And it can be really helpful to actually write down a list of things that your dog may react to. So for our Otis, for instance, it's it really was anything out of the ordinary. So for him, that included turning on the oven, turning away from him, just standing up. It could be other dogs, people were especially high in his list. So you may even write in categories of very, very high FAS to like mid high, uh, mid FAS to the lower FAS, because dogs may also have a spectrum of what really stresses them out. So when it comes to this, one of the best things we can do is really limit their exposure. So as much as we can reduce or eliminate those triggers, that's ideal. So for instance, one thing that you can do with your clients or with your own dogs is even to have a sign right outside on your door. This is one I actually have on my own door because a lot of times I'm working and I don't really want to be interrupted myself. And it's also just a great way. I don't have to worry about that constant knocking on the door and people coming over and having to deal with that. So just having, having the delivery instructions, having to sign outside for where to leave the package, that can be one easy way to just reduce those constant triggers that can really be present in that dog's life. Also remembering that distance is your dog's friend. So when we're out on walks with our dog, we can do things like crossing the street when we see another dog or a person or those Halloween decorations, anything out of the ordinary this time of year that your pet may be prone to react to. So increasing distance by crossing the street, perhaps turning the other way. If we are on a sidewalk, maybe we go slightly off the sidewalk, we go up a driveway. Ideally, we can even use some objects too. So we may go behind a car, behind a fire hydrant, behind a bush. So we can use some of those visual barriers. And then also looking at ways we can also reduce some of the, the things that our dogs hear that are stressful for them. So looking at things like having some white or brown noise in the home, using some calming music. So just something that can help blunt some of the sounds that come in and also provide a calming effect for our dog. And then also pairing those positives with different stressors that they may encounter. So when we're out on walks, for instance, whenever a dog barks, it's my dog's cue to turn back towards me because they've learned that whenever dogs bark or react at them, then they get a really, really fabulous treat. So it's really become an automatic response. And that's, that's really what we want. Or same thing with construction noises or loud, sudden noises. Whenever they hear that, it's their cue to come running to me because good things happen. And so that can help to reduce that the stress and also reduce that reactivity when they have a different go-to response and feeling in that situation. And same thing with different like human voices. I have a bus stop right near my house. And so we have lots of people uh, pretty much constantly by the fence or that go by the window. So being able to have that as well. So loud human voices or something unnatural, something different out of the ordinary that becomes their, their cue to come towards me. And also looking at the managed exposure and those paired positives. So right here, you'll see little Quinn B. This is my parent's dog, one of the ones that's with me right now. And us using a fear-free fortress with her, which is basically just her safe space. So it could be a crate or a carrier with the door left open. Here, it's a playpen that she can move in and out of, has all of her feel-good things, her comfortable bedding, her sleepy pods that we were getting her used to using before we used them in the car and rewarding her in there, minimizing exposure too, as you'll see. So using some window film, things like that, because we wanna really help to reduce the overall stress that our dog feels. And if they're constantly feeling stressed out, they're a lot more likely to just be on edge already and all the more prone to react. So the more that we can reduce that stress in the home, it's really gonna help when we take them out in situations like on a walk or to the vet. So here's an example of managing their exposure. Here's Queen Bee's little fear-free fortress area that she likes hanging out in. It's kind of her favorite. Her dog's like chilling by her too, huh? She gets tossed with the treats in there. Right now, you won't even believe the construction we're having. Is a little crazy. So I'm just gonna show you some of what we have going on. So I have the curtains pulled, but that's not doing the primary work. It's also with the, I have these little window film sheets, um, which work really well. We have lots of construction going on out there and it can be really, really, really loud. And they have short bursts where they are doing some really loud activities. So this is working really well. We have the 
some calming music going over there. And just trying to minimize some of that. And we also have a white voice machine going. And then anytime any of those scary sounds come on, we toss some treats or they already have chewies or something else that they really like. So it's working pretty well, even with literally construction right outside of the house, right next to us. They're all staying pretty chill. <laughs> oh, they're so cute. So another thing that we can do too, when we talk about paired positives and managing their exposure. So in some situations, it's really, really hard to manage their exposure. Like for instance, when I went over to a client's home and met the dog for the first time, I'm still in that given space with that dog. And so even though I can be at a distance and the dog has a choice to move closer to me or to move away, it still is a lot of exposure. So ideally, and what I actually did with, with Marvin was had her after this session to help help pair positives with people passing by or dogs at a distance. So doing this from inside the home, looking out the window, doing this on the patio, on the porch, looking out from their car. So that's one way that we can really manage that exposure. And here, since I'm in there, right there with the dog, having a considered approach. So I was turned to the side, avoiding direct eye contact. And ideally, the next time I was with Marvin, I wanted to have less sticky treats because these ones were really, even though they were very high value, they were really hard to toss. So they didn't toss out as far as I would have liked. So sometimes the treat came a little closer than I would have liked because I knew he wasn't entirely comfortable. And you'll see that with his body language where he's still a little bit hesitant. His, his weight is really centered on his back legs for that ready getaway. So here's an example with this. And you'll also see how we switch up how we were seated. So I moved in different ways with where I was positioned and where his owner was positioned to kind of see what would help him to feel a little bit more relaxed. Really careful. Um, it's good that he's coming up and eating. That's a really good one. Good, buddy. Good job. Yeah, that's really nice. Good boy. That's really good. So I'm going to try and avoid eye contact with him. Yeah. Okay. That way. There we go. So that way he'll be closer. So there he, at the end, he did get a little bit more comfortable when we changed the way that we were sitting. So his owner actually created a little bit of a visual barrier for him and a little bit more of a sense of security for him. And later he actually was able to go up on our lap, which helped him to feel even safer, which you'll see in a little bit. So another thing that we want to do, so as I mentioned, pairing positives with different things. So even here in the house, and sorry, I did not give a bark warning to everybody. There are There is barking. And one thing I'm even doing here with my parents' dogs, Cutie and Quimby, is with the barking, every once in a while, I'm just tossing a treat when it happens. So it's that concept of when that scary thing or that disturbing thing happens, you get something that is feel good, that's, that's really tasty. So we get that different expectation. So here's an example with Marvin, where anything sudden or different was really scary. And so for, for him, the sound of someone clearing their throat, for instance, which I have all the time with having um, those seasonal allergies, we started to pair that with some treats coming. And you'll see by the second time, he's already having that happy expectation when, when I do that. Mm -hmm. You'll keep the one that has the treat in it. Like, okay, like <clears throat> excuse me, put a treat in right there. So anytime that I make a weird noise or a person like like stands or moves, mm -hmm. that's a perfect opportunity to reward him. Okay. And then what we can do, excuse me, I'm gonna go ahead and make a, a clump of throat. So <laughs> if I do, go ahead and reward him. <clears throat> okay. Good boy. That was very good. So for some dogs, it can actually happen really, really fast. Now, here's an example with Otis, and this is when we first got him. And when I tell you he was reactive at, at what felt like everything, I'm, in reality, it wasn't everything, but it really did feel like it. I really mean it. Like here, it was just putting on my makeup. I wasn't planning on filming this day. We had just moved in this apartment as we got a new dog. So that's why it's a mess in there. 
but you'll see he started to react with me just putting on makeup. So just put, putting on makeup, putting on lotion, looking in the mirror, anything different. So having a different object in my hand, he was very, very, very sensitive. So I just want to give the, I just want to show this video to give you some ideas of how you might deal with dogs that are, are really prone to letting their feelings be known. And when they're really anxious. So for him, he just really had that general anxiety. And so what we started to do is pair anything new, anything novel with something really tasty and also trying to reinforce those calm, quiet behaviors. Otis does not like looking in the mirror. What is it? Good boy. You know, one for that. That's very good. Good. The right turn to look in the mirror. It's kind of upsetting to him. You know, we're doing every time he turns back. Good. Good. Good boy. Why that one quiet? Here you go. Turn around looking at the mirror. Good. We're going to be bright guards. Okay. Good. Do you want to see that? Good. Oh, <laughs> you don't want to eat it. Go and check it. Good boy. That's all that is. Silly. Silly pants. Good choice, good boy. Look at the new island. Look at the mirror. Good. Very nice. So in that video, that's more of, <laughs> I would say just an everyday type of training. So I was literally still getting ready, not even turned looking towards him, but that, that was really what I did a lot with him. And that can be something helpful for those dogs that are really prone to reacting uh, with just different household things, things that you feel are normal, but that to your dog are super scary. And it's really hard to minimize all of those triggers when the dog has so many different stressors that they are reacting to as, as was the case with Otis. So with him, I was reserving his food primarily for training. And so we'd still give him some in his food puzzle, but a lot of it, I was giving by hand, trying to help condition him to feeling, having those positive feelings around different things. So different objects, different ways that people moved, all these things that were so new and abnormal to him, which, which automatically really were categorized as scary for him. So that is just one way that we can do that. And so I did the same thing with other, other situations as well with him. So another situation and what we're going to get into, and you'll see a lot of different videos of dogs on leash. So that reactivity on leash is incredibly common. And I would say as a trainer, that's one of the most common behaviors that I do see. And although there are so many different tactics and so many ways that we could address this, and there's so much more that I could give you, I really wanted to narrow it down to some of the top ways that I like to address this, not only with my own dogs, but also with clients dogs because I want to really get into the nitty gritty of how these behaviors might be used rather than giving you just a ton and it not being as useful. Let's dig in. And I want to really focus in on some of those key behaviors that we can use. And so that's what, what you'll see today. So with that said, here is Otis out on treats. And as I mentioned, it was really hard with him because this is when we first adopted him and his reactivity was incredibly high. It's funny how when I was looking at getting, adding a second dog, my daughter Reagan essentially chose the dog we were going to get. And I was just like, fingers crossed, let's, let's pray that we don't have another reactive dog because it, it, you know how it goes. Sometimes you just get certain dogs and I've had a lot of different reactive dogs throughout, out, 
the years and thought, gosh, it'd be nice to just have another easy laid back dog like Indiana Bones. And of course, we get Otis, who's really, really high on the reactivity scale. And so he taught me a lot, definitely. So I'm, I'm so grateful for him. And he's just really become the best dog. But it was very, very difficult because we lived in a really crowded third floor apartment, dogs, people everywhere. And so you'll see in the videos with him, there are different times where he's reacting. And it's like, how do we address that in the moment? Because ideally we prevent them from getting to that point where they feel like they need to react. But in reality, sometimes we're in these situations where we really can't totally prevent that. And that was a situation that I was in with Otis. So I want to show some of these videos that way you can see some ways that we can address it. And I think sometimes taking that, that human anxiety about what if they react or that, that fear of them reacting, if we can help to calm ourselves down and have an action plan that can also really help not only to give us that guidance on how to react, but also help us to keep calm, which I really do think translates to down the leash to the dog as well. So here's a video with Otis and this is with a person walking by and different people moving in the car and what we do when he's, when he does react and also later when he's about to react. Hi. Awesome. So reward and worthy moment. We can check it in. What I'm going to do is find it. The first person walking past. And you'll find it once you put it down towards the ground. I'm going to find it. So focusing his energy towards something alternative rather than barking. Good. Make sure what to say. There's a person getting in the car over there. I'm not going to go ahead and do a find it with him. Find it. And his focus down. He's sniffing and looking at the ground. Sniffing is naturally calming for dogs. And he's also getting those treats. So it's helping to build that happier emotional state and giving him an alternative behavior rather than the bark and lunch. Like, like Kelly's getting a little amped up there. His body was getting stiffer. His ears were really pretty forward. So I want to try and interrupt him. He just focus good before he barks. And sometimes Otis will just bark at generally anything that's different in the environment. So I want to try and give him new habits. And in order to give him those new habits, I want to try and break that old habit before it starts and give him a new pattern to put in its place. So instead looking towards me. Good, very nice job. Okay, let's go. And I'm using a big portion of Otis's meal for our training. So I'm reducing his meal size. That way, a lot of his portion is actually coming through training. So it helps keep him motivated and also helps us keep him in a healthier way. Good shake off. Now, shake off is a good way for him to relieve stress and kind of reset. So something kind of stressful happens for a dog. They might shake off after. So it really is just like a reset. And I want to reinforce him for that. All right. So those are some good examples there. And, and in those situations, say I had seen that person walking up behind me that had come from the carport right there. I would have tried to actually create space. I would have moved further away when I saw them. But in that situation, they were quiet, didn't see them, kind of snuck up on us. And so that that was how I could react in that moment. And I could have also used things like going behind a bush right there. So really paying attention when you have a reactive dog to where you might go for increasing distance or what object you might be able to use to, to move behind to help create a visual barrier. And also that sense of security for some dogs that that really feel a little bit more secure when they're behind something like that. So here's another example of Otis and what we did in this situation where he saw a person, I wasn't prepared for it, and how we helped to gently interrupt it and redirect him to something else. 
And you'll also notice too, that with him, when I first started working with him, I was using a bungee leash and I don't often use those with most dogs. And in fact, I really like having the fixed length leashes, but for a dog that is really reactive and I'm not worried about them rushing up to another dog or person or actually show, like showing up like like biting for instance so if I'm not worried about that but it's more like the reactivity and, and I've noticed that they get really tense on leash so whenever the leash gets tight they get really tense and there's that reaction and for dogs that pull like Otis where he hadn't really been taught to walk on a leash before in the interim I use that bungee leash which helped to reduce some of, of that tension on the leash and then later we we transition to those fixed length leashes and also you can pair positives with that leash tension which we'll get into but in their in the interim, without even worrying so much about teaching loose leash walking at the time, I was really focused on reactivity. That's where that bungee leash really came in handy, as well as that front clip harness. So uh, here we go with Otis. Good. So I'm giving him a lower value treat, so getting rewarded, just for every little check-in that he does. It helps to keep him calm and focused. And rewards those good behaviors I still want to reinforce, but also keeps him motivated to Oh, right here. Right here. Good boy. Good job. Right here, right here, buddy. Right here, right here. That's where he gets that really good steak. Oh, boy. So whenever there is a person, that's when, when he would get staked or something that was really high value for him. So it's like, eventually, as you'll see with him, it's like he sees that person or that dog, and then he automatically checks back in. And part of that is always pairing it with something really, really feel good for him as much as possible. Break that up. Sit. Good boy. That's good. You can see a person with a foot. Oh, right touch. Just make him moving towards me. Doesn't have to touch me all the way. Oh, good boy. Getting something else to focus on. Good boy. Very nice. So smart, Odie. Right hey, buddy. Right good job. Good. Oh, good job, bud. Hi. Screen forcing him for looking towards me. Hey. All right. You didn't want some job. Okay, let's go. So we'll go back to my lower value tree because there's no first around yet. Good. Good boy. So Otis was extremely, extremely hypervigilant when we first got him. And again, sometimes people would sneak up on us. So we lived in a huge apartment complex. People would come from all different sides and it was a lot. So in, in those situations, sometimes I, could, I couldn't catch it before he did. Oftentimes he would see it, smell it, he would hear it. And so a lot of times it was, okay, how do I respond in that moment? And so that gentle interruption and ideally that, that redirection to something positive we can reward them for is ideal and using those higher value treats for those higher stress situations. And during that time also notice that there's a higher frequency of reward. So I'm rewarding a lot more often than I would if he was calm and relaxed, which would be the case if we're on a, a walk and we're going a long distance and it's in a more secluded area, I wouldn't be using nearly as many treats in that situation. Another training tactic that I really like for reactive dogs is a hand target or a touch. And I'm going to show you how this is done with Marvin. And then I'm going to show some examples of how we can use it for reactive dogs. You can start off with a treat on the inside of your hand if you want. And then just go ahead and have that treat on the inside of your hand. Have your hand closed and just put it out in front of his nose. Soon as soon as touch it, go ahead. And then go ahead and open up and give him a treat. All right. And then I'm going to have you put that in front of his nose. Go ahead. And then go ahead and give him that treat. Good job, Bob. Perfect. What we want to do is we want to have the one hand be your hand target hand. The other one, you can reach in and grab a reward or just have that mm -hmm. treat in your other hand to give him. Okay. What we're going to do is we're just going to put that empty hand in front of him. And as soon as he does, good. Good job, Bobby. And then go ahead and give him that treat from the other hand. Yeah, perfect. Good job. So I'm going to keep the one with the treat back. And so okay. his main focus will be on the one without the touch. So if he doesn't do it, go ahead and move that hand back into the side. And then go ahead and say your word touch again. Touch. Good. Good boy. 
And so if you're kind of moving out in front of his face, um, what we can do too is you may just kind of, if he doesn't notice it right away, we can just move it slightly to the side even. His socks are pretty big on movement. Mm -hmm. Touch. Good. good job. That was awesome. That was really good. Good job. Good job. Touch. Good. Good boy. Awesome. Touch. And hold it there and wait. And let's see if he'll do it. And if he doesn't, then just move your hand back. Oh, he's made it. Good. Right there. Good yeah, boy. Good awesome. touch. So that's a great way for dogs to say hi to someone new. And also we can move them voluntarily using that hand target. So here are a couple of other dogs and these dogs had different way, different times that they were reactive and also had some inner dog aggression. And here was teaching a touch or hand target to Hula who was deaf. So we're using a thumbs up as the marker signal before delivering the treat. And I want to show how that was used here uh, to give you some more ideas of how you might be able to use this in the home and otherwise. Good. So basically the basic premise is that their nose touches your hand and so you can use it to move them around. So um, that way you don't want to physically move them. They just start to move their or nose to your hand. So it's a good way also for them to say hi. So like for, um, for Cora, it'd be a good way for her to like, go say hi to people is like she gets to go say hi with the hand target or something like that so okay. then there's like a very specific way that she goes up and says hi so that and they, they know and yeah knows. yeah exactly okay. right there anytime that um she comes around for food we're going to drop in a treat so we're dropping in some treats we can move her around just by using our hand target so we can kind of you know having her to the side is going to be easier than um direct facing then she gets good at this, then we can start to have her turn more directly towards her, which is going to be a little bit more intimidating, as well as adding in some movement. I'm going to move that tree again. It's distracting. Hold on. <laughs> so then I'm going to move that there. There we go. Have her jump down, and then she gets the treat there. And then also for Cora, she's gonna get treats whenever he comes close. So okay, makes it a good thing. Yeah, she likes that a lot. <laughs> Oops, there we go. Look, she's like, why did I get one that time? So that was a really, really useful behavior and definitely really helped them. Here's an example of how yeah. this was used with a different um, Connie Corso named Valkyrie. And so I'll show you this one. What we can use, we can start to add this in. Starting to use that out on your watch. So we'll say that she does see that other dog, like say that there's something of, of interest over here. And then what we can do is we can do our touch. And so we can start to turn her back towards us. Good girl. Yeah, and that's a really good one too. So that way, if she is with another dog and you're like, oh, things might be getting a little heated, we can also use that that behavior. So say that we're out in a walk and she's over here, I can use the okay. Found a stick. Oh, she likes sticks. Mm -hmm. Good girl, that's so good. Good. Okay. Good. So we also can make it kind of like that fun game. So like right there when she's having to trot a little bit to catch up, that's uh -huh. fun. Like that's good. So we want to keep her interest high. So this is a really good game. Catch. Good. Very nice. So that's a really good one for just reactivity. If they're excited, 
So the other thing too, that I want to mention is that with any of these behaviors, we also want to do it not only in the presence of stressors, but also just when they're calm and relaxed. So that way the cue in and of itself doesn't become a, a cue like, uh oh, here comes a dog or here comes a person because they're asking me to touch. So that's just, just a little side note, but I think it is something for, important to mention. And in this situation, you will see, so Valkyrie had reactivity to different situations, dogs, people, anything kind of out of the ordinary. And in this situation, because it was at a park, and even though we were in a more secluded part of it, there were still different triggers and things coming in into the environment that we couldn't control. And so sometimes things or people would come a little bit too close. So here was how the hand target was able, how we were able to use it to redirect her attention and to move her away in a situation where she would have otherwise reacted at the end of the leash. Click her right there, and then treat. Click, and then I'm gonna go ahead and treat. Okay. Then I'm gonna go ahead and treat. Instead of my click there, I just went ahead and use my word. All right, so I hope that gives you a good idea there. Now, the next one that we're moving into, and, you, and you've seen little hints of it throughout, is the behavior of look at that or the engage, disengage game. On the handout that is going to be shared, uh, I, I believe it's probably already shared, but Leilani will be sharing that. There is some evidence of, uh, or there is a, a citing of different resources. And one of those is Click to Calm book by Emma Parsons. So if you wanna go more in depth on how to do look at that engage, disengage game, I would, I would definitely highly recommend that. And there's some other resources I recommend as well. But I wanna show how this was done with Marvin and then we'll show how it was used with some of the other reactive dogs that we've already watched today as well. And so the other thing I want you to practice with me right now is every time he looks over at me, if he just looks over, has that quiet mouth, ideally those ears forward, I want you to reward him. Those be good. Is that a noise? They're good. Perfect. Good. They're so good. Good job, bud. Very good. He's really smart, I can tell. He knows when he's not even thinking. That's good, right? That was awesome. That was really good. Yeah, that was awesome. So he's starting to actually do that on his own mm -hmm. where he's like looking over at me and then he's like checking back in with you. He's like, oh, get a reward for that. I'm just going to move a little bit. So right there, it's good. So you saw at the towards the end of that, I'm starting to put in some movement. So it's it's really using that desensitization, counter conditioning, and we are doing it in a way that we are gradually increasing the intensity of that stimuli over time. And we're, we are also pairing it with a, a big positive. And for a lot of dogs, I don't even necessarily always put that on cue. Uh, I do it more so as more of that automatic check-in when they see that thing, that person, that thing that they would normally react towards. A lot of times it is that association that I look at it and then I check back in with you, but we can also put it on cue. So I think it really depends on the dog and the situation and really ideally actually having both. So both having it on cue and having it automatic can be really helpful because sometimes we don't notice things that our dog definitely notices, just like in the case with Otis. So I want to show the, the use of this with Valkyrie. And this is just her first time ever doing this. And there are some Dogs, I believe, over there with some people playing fetch at a distance. And this is how we did this game. So I'm just going to go ahead and click right there. And I'm going to reward her. Click. And then I'm going to reward. Okay. Go ahead and click that. And I'm going to treat her over to the side. So that way she's starting to kind of turn her head automatically. So let's click right there. Treating over towards the side. So she automatically starts to turn. 
So being over on the side, that can help because I, ideally what we want to get over time is the dog looking at that and then looking back towards us, which we can get more easily by where we are actually treating the dog. So being at their side can be very, very helpful. And here is an example of doing this with Eli. And you'll see some of the progression of how we do this. And with him, also notice that at times it, it doesn't, he doesn't necessarily even need to look all the way at it. Just him turning his ears, licking his ears towards that sound that he would normally react to, that was enough. And I, I also just to mention, Eli was highly, highly, highly reactive. He was the type of dog that really didn't, wasn't able to be walked outside and really go beyond the, the front porch. And, and even there was really reactive. So most of the time it was in the, in the backyard or just went right to dog class because he was so reactive. So this made a huge difference for him, just being able to hang out on the porch and being able to be more calm and relaxed by, by playing this game. And, and you'll see some examples in here. Right so essentially with the look, we can use a sound, we can use a sight, anything like that. And then okay. what we're initially doing is I'm gonna go to a even though. Go ahead and just even an ear shift is enough. He doesn't even have oh, to look okay. all the way over. Oh, okay. So you're just gonna use it. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and reward that. So uh, whether he looks over at it or he just you know kind of turns his head because he's like, it's too bright. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and either switch up his focus after each time mm -hmm. or I'm going to continue playing that game. But with look, initially we're just clicking for him. Just Doing orienting any, towards that, that stimulus, whether it's his ears, his eyes, anything like that. Keep touch. And then what we want to get is for him to later look at it or to, you know, turn his ears and then turn his focus back towards you. So it's almost mm -hmm. like his way of like alerting you, hey, mom, look at, look, there's something mm -hmm. over there. So let's go ahead and use um, maybe this if that's not too much of a stimulus okay. right there. Good job. Very nice. We can even use just the sound of. Uh, the person at a distance from the book. And then I'm oh, treating I'm back towards me. Place. So that way we're getting that. Even an ear is just enough for us. Okay. Good job. I'm going to go back to head turn right now um, for what I'm going to be clicking for. Wow, oh, that's really an improvement. Yeah, I think this might be a really good one for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, right here. Right. So I just want to break that up. Good job. And I can also use my body as a barrier for him mm -hmm. so that way he can feel safer. Good. Good. What I what eventually want is for him, and I'll show you, this is the next step. So the first step is we are clicking from looking over. But I want to get his head to come back towards me so he looks over. But so I waited it out there, but if I think he's going to react, that's where I may um, do it a little prompt. quicker. Mm -hmm. So right now he's comfortable enough uh, that I can do this and wait for him to turn his head back.
good job. That was really good. So one thing you'll notice too, is that for those dogs that maybe are a little slow on looking over, you can also look yourself. So you may say, look, and then look in that direction. And, and a lot of times that can be really helpful because they'll, they'll take their cue from you as well. So that's why I'm doing that with turning my own head. And here's an example of also teaching this with a neutral stimulus. So we don't always have to teach it first with that dog or with that person. Although sometimes I will do that if it's just right in the midst and, and we're in that situation already, but ideally we teach it first with a neutral stimulus, which here we were just using a tubware. So really anything that they notice could be a really low value toy. Maybe it's a bird outside the window, whatever it might be. We can use something really neutral, like a, a cup for instance, or Kleenex box, something like that. So what we do is we do the same game where we initially are clicking them just for looking at it or orienting towards it. And then eventually what we wanna get is that sequence of them looking at it and then looking back towards us. And so we can, can start to get towards that, which also in those situations that are really high intensity or, or the dog is really stressed, we may, we may go back, make it easier for them. So just clicking them for looking over at it and waiting until they're calm and relaxed again before we, we really request that they look all the way back in, in with us. It's gonna move that tub work again. Good job, okay. Now she's starting to kind of get this, okay? Go ahead and move that again. I want right there. So that's an example there. And also just so you know, I do have a lot of videos that you can check out more in depth on, on all of these dogs that are up on YouTube. And I'll have that link at the end as well. And it's on the handout. So here's an example of what this might look like. This was actually going out yesterday with Otis, the, our reactive dog. He's come a long ways. You'll see, we can walk him now on a flat collar, fixed length leash. And this actually was with something that would be very high FAS for him. It normally, which is a little kid riding a bike with a dad, with two two women across the street separately, and then also with some big blow up Halloween witches that were really scary. So there was just a whole heck of a lot going on during our walk. And this was how I used the look at that during the walk with him in a situation that could be more stressful. And you'll also see how he's actually automatically doing this. So a lot of times I don't even really need to cue it with him, but I did add in that cue um, just so you could have that for an example. Okay. Yeah, it happens. It's funny about the items, huh? Good boy. All right. Let's go. So really it's become his automatic response when he hears or sees something different and out of the ordinary is to start checking in with, with me and we can use that on a walk as well. So once you get it in a stationary position, also practice it with movement. And here's another example of Valkyrie and in this situation, this is being able to do it on her portable safe space or her settle space, which is her yoga mat. And we had also worked on teaching her the behavior of chill, which is doing a relaxed down. And this is how look was used in this situation, which can give you an example of how you might use it in the home. Yeah, or so if you're using it outside. Outside. Uh, very good. Yeah, so we want her to like, learn that's kind of like her, her place to kind of settle relax. It's really good because what we're doing is we're helping her nervous system also to kind of calm down. And so she's learning to like chill out even in an environment where she may be more kind of stressed out. So right now I'm going to go ahead and add in, I'm going to be treating more often. You know? Good job. So we can do the look behavior when she's on her mat. Do the book. I'm gonna go ahead and click right there. Was that like a coincidence that she looked right? Look. No, she's got it. She's so smart. Look. So we don't have kids, but we have uh, nieces and nephews. So. All right. So that's another example of how it's used.
So another thing is be aware of the poison cue. And I know for anyone that's ever heard me speak before, you may have heard me with this, that flowers used to be one of those poison cues for me because it's like whenever I got them after being in some not great relationships, I'm in a good one now, thankfully, but uh, flowers always meant something bad that that person had done something really crummy or they're making up for something. But usually it was like an indicator, like, uh oh. I better be wary. Something bad's going to happen. And same thing can happen with dogs. So for them, things like having uh, peanut butter on the end of a spatula, for instance, they may learn like, uh uh-oh, something bad's going to happen because whenever they do that, that might be when we're using distractions for nail trims in a way that the dog is forced to stay in place, forced to endure it versus it being voluntary and versus it being at their own pace. And so sometimes the same thing can happen on walks. So things like a tight leash or turning and moving in the other direction can really become a poison cue. So a couple of things that we can do is to help address that with our dogs by turning those those things that could be a poison cue, like those flowers for me, uh, which now they have been made into a positive. But for dogs like the tight leash or turning and moving in the other direction, we want to pair that with something positive and also teach them ideally to even do it on cue. So to move with us on cue, to turn with us on cue, and to also turn into any, any leash pressure. So you'll see that in the upcoming videos. So here's an example with Valkyrie. So with her, so we don't, you don't need to use a click or anything with this. I'm just going to practice like every once in a while, the leash gets tight. So we're walking. No, she's and then the leash gets tight. I'm going to go ahead and pair that with a treat. Okay. So I'm going to hold up on the leash. And I'm going to get her a treat. So that way we make it like where it's like, oh, when that happens, it's not something bad. Because okay. otherwise, sometimes it's like, it is like when that, that leash tension happens, like something stressful is about to occur. And so right. they're like, ooh, they think something bad's gonna happen. So right there, I'm just gonna have a little bit of tension. And we don't try it with the harness here, but I feel like we put tension on her collar and then it's like, um, she starts to tense up. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, like, you know. super, super, yeah, exactly. So so what, what, <laughs> what you can do is, um, I would even practice doing that with her collar and with the harness. So yeah, we put that up. tension on. And then we treat. So yeah, practice that. If, if that's a really good point you brought up. So we, we want to make that like where it's like, oh, when it happens, like something good happens. So it's like, right. it doesn't become a cue in and of itself to be concerned or worried. All or so. itself, it is really hard. So right there, I could even just practice right there. Yeah, good girl. So sometimes too, with the pressure, a lot of times I also like to turn, teach them to turn in towards me. So like right there, we have some tension and then Let's see if we can get her to do that again, actually. So, so we have a little bit of tension right there. I'm going to go ahead. Right here. Right here. Good job. Very good. So I want to teach her to turn in towards me whenever she does feel that tension. So... See that we are getting anything else. That's so good. They're kind of, so the behavior you're seeing right now is there's tension on the leash and she seeks out to release it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So she turns towards me and then I give her that reward. So say that we are walking, there's tension on the leash right there. Let's see. She, and then right there, I'm just going to. Good job. That was so good. So she's already figured out that is like her cue to turn back towards me, which is perfect. That's so good. You're so as smart. Cute as you just just even that like that that little bit of tension right okay. there. She's learned like whenever that happens, then good job. So if you don't have your clicker with you, you can also use a word. So my go to words, I use the word um, treat, and then that just means a treat is coming. So have a go-to word that you can use in the in place of the clicker if you don't have your clicker with you. Right there, I'm just going to use a little bit of attention. If she didn't turn towards me, if she didn't turn towards me, that's where I could use that kind of like some kind of prompt so I could be trying to get her attention a different way. Would you say like, come on? So right there, so if I didn't get it, I'd kind of do more like the kissing noise or something like that or like some kind of like um, even like shuffling my feet or like kind of patting my legs or some some kind of other attention getter. 
All right. And then here is teaching turn on cue. So this is an important one for those situations where we do need to change directions fast that we can actually get our dog to move with us. So I use this all the time with my dogs out on walks just during normal times without even seeing another dog, which is really important. And it's really helpful because I can get my dog's attention and I can get them right there with me, even just if I'm turning to cross the street without a dog, but it's especially helpful for those reactive dogs. Oh, and also the cue of moving out. So I usually use the word, let's go. But in this situation, I use the, the cue, come on, because that is the cue that the family was already using for Valkyrie. Good job. Good job. So I'm gonna say that word turn, and then we're gonna go ahead and treat. Good, very good. So we can practice turning in different directions, like away from her, towards her. Uh, she doesn't turn right away, that's making like cut her leg. Do another kind of prompt. Like we're saying the, the sign, which just means like, we're going to start walking with her. And then we're using that word. Good. She's so smart. She's doing really well. So she's already like. Good. That's so good. You're doing so well. Leilani, do I have time for one last video? Yep. Go ahead with one last video. Um, it's right at six o'clock, but go ahead with that and then we'll close out for today. Okay, perfect. Sounds good. So I want to show how to put this all together. So this is Otis. This is at our Spokane Manitou Park. And there are lots of people all around. And But this is a lower stress situation for Otis compared to the, the earlier one where there was the little kid on the tricycle that was really, really upsetting to him with the, well, not upsetting, but I definitely higher arousal. And so we did a lot more treating. And this is a little bit lower key, but still lots of stuff going on. And how we use some of these training exercises with him and how this this can also be used for reactive dogs. Very nice, OD. I like your happy face. Oh, that was really good. Good job, baby. Okay. I bet. Oh, let's go. Oh, almost makes me tear up a little bit just seeing how far Otis has come. He's come such a long way. And as I mentioned, it's I didn't necessarily want a reactive dog, but I'm so glad with the dog that we got. He's just incredible and has taught me so much. And so I hope you enjoyed this. Feel free to reach out. Here are some great resources. All of these videos and more I put up on YouTube so that way you could have free access to them and you can check them out at any point in time. And I just so much appreciate you taking this time to be with me. And I hope that this was helpful. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Raquel, for your knowledge and expertise. Otis is adorable, and I love seeing him on meetings and being able to see him in your presentation today as well. Uh, so on behalf of Fear Freak, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, the recording of today's webinar will be shared with you within one week to your email address that you've registered with, and we'll also include that handout for you. Um, I know we didn't get to get to very many questions today, um, but we'll go ahead and include that handout in your follow-up. Uh, email as well, um, just because that's also a great resource. You might be able to find some more information in there.
Uh, please be sure to follow us on social media at Fear Free Pets and sub subscribe to our newsletter for invitations to future presentations. Our next webinar will be on October 12th and focus on integrating supplements into your treatment plans. You can register today on fearfreepets.com to attend. We hope you have a great evening and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you again, Michaela, and good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Leilani. Bye.